Hello, welcome to Get a Better Handle on Life. I'm Barry Winbolt and this is my podcast. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking about a concept I call headroom in relation to stress. It will help you manage your stress. But more importantly than that, it will help you develop an aptitude that leads to greater resilience and being better prepared for unexpected events. Stick with this episode and you'll learn better to cope with those unexpected occurrences that can trip us all up. But before I do, please support my channel. If you're finding this useful, leave a thumbs up, leave a comment, even share it, or better still, all three, because spreading the word is what I'm all about. And if you help me spread the word, more people get to see this content. I hope you find it useful. I hope they will. That's what I'm all about. So what can you expect from this episode? I'll deliver three things. I'll define headroom and explain what it means and why I developed this concept. It's a word I use. I haven't seen it described anywhere else in this context, but I found it a very useful context for thinking about stress in my own life and also explaining stress to my clients. So that's the first thing, an understanding of what headroom means. Second, what can we do to build more headroom into our lives? What are the habits and how do we apply them? And you'll have heard many before, but I think I've got a new take on how they're applied and why so often our attempts at managing our stress, at being a better type of person, you know, you lose it for no apparent reason or you get confused and stressed and uh, reverse instead of drive forward, whatever it is. You do things which you wouldn't normally do because you're under extreme pressure. So I'll provide a way out of that because this is a new way of thinking how you go about keeping yourself within, let's call it, safe limits. And the third thing I'll give you is a way of measuring your stress levels at any given moment because, as they say, you can't Manage it if you can't measure it. If you don't know how stressed you are moment by moment, then how are you going to decide when you need to do something about it? And stress is a tricky devil, as I will show you. It will deceive you. But moving on. So those three things I'm going to explain. What is headroom? How to develop it? And last but not least, and very importantly, a mechanism which I call the stress gauge or the stress barometer. I've put it out in both forms. It's the same thing. It's just that I've changed the language from time to time. The stress gauge, let's call it for now, which I will share with you towards the end of this podcast because that's where it belongs. And then it provides you with a next step, an action plan to actually start to learn more about stresses in your life, how they affect you, and more importantly, to be able to assess their impact on you and in such a way that you can then react differently. So that's a big promise and I'll fit it into the next 10 minutes or so, so stick around. So what do I mean by headroom? Well, simply put, headroom means spare capacity. Think about it. Stress, red line. You'd imagine, scale of 1 to 10. 1, you're chilled, totally relaxed. 10, you're stressed out of your box, you can't think straight, you're making mistakes possibly becoming even a danger to yourself or others. Maybe you're picking up bad habits. Maybe you're smoking more, drinking more. Whatever it happens to be, stress pushes us to the limit. And when we reach that limit and keep going with the stress, we become dysfunctional. As I've often said, stress makes us idiots. Of course, you're not an idiot. I'm not an idiot. But it makes us think and act idiotically. That's my opinion of it, having worked with stressed individuals for over 30 years. And I must say, by observing myself, by watching myself. Now, let me give you a quick example and a tool. So here's a fourth thing. I was once in a hospital with somebody who was extremely ill. You know, it's endless roundabout of going to hospital appointments, waiting around a long time. Finally, the consultant shows. And there was an added complication in this particular situation, which was... I'd had to park on short-term parking quite a distance from the, the hospital. So the time was ticking away. We'd used up our two hours. I'm beginning to get more and more on a short fuse, worrying about the parking, worrying about the person I was accompanying to hospital who was extremely ill, and I needed to have an opinion, the medical opinion, as did she. 
So that's where we were. Oh, and by the way, we had the kids with us, two children, uh, one young teenager, and one eight or nine years old. So there we were in this hospital. My fuse is burning. I'm beginning to boil over because I'm worried that I'm not going to be there for the appointment because I've got to rush out and feed the meter or whatever it was, pay the parking on my car. And I was about to say something inappropriate or act. I just caught sight of myself being a bit idiotic, a bit stupid, because I was afraid of what we we're going to hear from the doctor and stressed by all the other things that were going on around me. And then I had a glimmer, a glimpse of something, of myself. And we were with the children, as I said. And the glimpse I got was of me being in a not a very good place, about to boil over. And I thought to myself, how do I want my children to remember this moment? And I thought, well, I'd like them to be proud of me. I'd like to, at a very scary time for us all, I'd like to demonstrate that I can keep my cool, hold it together and provide a good role model. And of course, if I start to yell and shriek and panic, I'd have done it in a very dignified way, you understand. But had I have started that, the kids would have watched that. And I didn't want that. So it was as if there was a camera on the wall looking down on me. And the question I've turned that into in my therapeutic practice over the years, to say to people, to pull us back from that precipice, from the edge, is just imagine somebody's making a documentary of your life. There's a camera on the wall, and there usually is these days, isn't there? Because I came up with this over 20 years ago. Well, today we've got cameras everywhere, so you don't have to look very far to imagine one. Imagine there's a camera on the wall filming your every action right now. And imagine, too, that the narrator has some insight into what's happening inside you. They're making a documentary about you losing it. How do you want this moment to be recorded for posterity? How do you want others to see you or to talk about you once this is over? How would you make yourself proud in this moment? And that's the key thing. Get in touch with what you would be like to demonstrate as behaviour, which subsequently you'd be proud of. You, I handled that well. You know, maybe you get a bit wobbly, but you wouldn't get disrespectful, angry, uh, panicking, screw, whatever, whatever stress does to you. Now, that was a very useful tool. So that's just one tool I'm giving you. And it's the point I'm trying to demonstrate about what I call a red line. I was at a point in my day that this had been building for weeks, by the way. I was at a point, let's say my boiling point is 7 out of 10. Well, but I'd already gone way past seven at that point. And what I needed to do was somehow put myself back to a five or a six so that I still had some control over my thoughts. Because one thing that stress does, I said it makes idiots of us, it distorts your thinking. It has to. It's a survival response. It wants you to think you're superhuman. It wants you to think you can do more than you actually physically are having trouble delivering. And it doesn't want you to think about it because it's a survival response. It wants you to focus on the problem. So at this point, people often say they get confused, that type of thing. They can't think straight. They can't string their thoughts together. And we make mistakes. We forget things. We lose things, whatever it happens to be. So that's the whole concept I'm thinking of here. And the headroom is what happens when I get to seven. Have I got enough latitude to push that seven up a bit? So that actually I'm still within my range of coping and acting like a civilised human being. I haven't been pushed over to a point where I'm being controlled by a, a natural response, the fight or flight response. I'm still in control of my thoughts, my emotions, and I can still make conscious and sensible decisions about my behaviour and how I act. So that is what I mean by headroom. Developing headroom. How do you develop headroom, you might ask? Good question. And this is something, something came back to me recently. I was speaking to a guy in India called Manor uh, Grandi, and I'm going to be featuring him on the podcast in a couple of weeks' time. One of the things he said to me, which was extremely interesting, was that he'd had trouble sleeping, and he knew that mindfulness exercises or practicing mindfulness would be very useful in helping him to sleep. And being in India, he had plenty of choice. And he said, I tried them all, but none of them worked. Until I realised I was attempting to use mindfulness in desperation. I was already tired. I was already worried. I was already worn out. I was already stressed, in other words. And then I'd go along to a class and try 
mindfulness, expecting to relax and come out all chilled. But as I've often said in my practice to people I work with, don't wait until you're at the cliff edge before you try and learn the new skills. If you want to use mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, relaxation, deep breathing, any of these techniques, which are, I thoroughly recommend that you do, because they're good lifestyle habits, anything that involves breathing, then you're in a good place to be building your resilience. But your abilities to do those things won't be there when you need them if you wait till you're already stressed or under pressure. Which is why I say, and this is what Manuel Grandi said, do it when you don't need it. Practice it and get proficient at it in your downtime, when you relax, when the problem isn't a problem. And then when you need it, it'll be there for you. So I've been public speaking for many years. In the early days, I was rubbish. And some might say I still am. However, let's leave that aside for a moment. I was not good at it. And I wasn't confident. I wasn't self-assured. And I didn't hold an audience as I later learned to do. I couldn't engage in a way that they would hang on my every word. And they did. For up to six hours a day, I was doing seminars, live events, up to 500 people a day. And they were listening to me. And I know that from the feedback. I had tens of thousands of feedback forms over the 25 or so years that I was doing that. So I know it worked. Now, what changed? Well, what changed for me was that I learned before I went out on stage or onto, onto the podium to do a quick relaxation technique to kind of put myself in the zone, put myself in the right place. And I would use that later on in my life before important telephone calls, important meetings, whatever it happened to be. In one context, I was at the police uh, training college, I think it was called, in Wakefield in Yorkshire in the UK. And I was about to go on stage and I said to the guy, my minder, is there um, a, a, a room or somewhere I can have a couple of minutes to myself? Now, I've done this in the... In the restrooms, I've done it in a spare room around the building where I was. In this case, there wasn't anywhere. It was right by the stage. Uh, there was a, bloom, a broom closet. So I went in there. It was all dark. I spent two minutes in there just getting my head straight, relaxation, visualization, going out on stage, being good at it, reduced my stress levels and walked out on the stage feeling great about what I was about to do. Later on, when I'd finished it, my minder said to me, I don't know what you did in that broom closet, but I want some of that. I saw one guy walk in and another guy come out, and then you just walked onto the stage and you nailed it. Now, that was a great accolade coming from him. What I'm trying to demonstrate here, that wouldn't have happened by accident. That happened because I planned it. That happened because I gave myself headroom, because I actually spent a few minutes, and I say two minutes, it quite literally was that, when I started, it was probably over 15 minutes, something like that. I got quicker and I got better, but I practiced it when I didn't need it. I didn't start doing that when I had a big life performance to do. I practiced it over the weekends, in my downtime, when I was commuting, on a train, when I was traveling somewhere, flying. It's great for you to just chill out and the time passes. So I practiced mini meditations, if you like, so that when I needed to call on relaxation quickly, I had a tool. And it worked for me every time, and I still use it. So that's the application of headroom. And what I was saying about Manuel Grandi, you don't want to wait till you need it, as he said, his word, in desperation. You build these things into your lifestyle. The gym, uh, yoga, whatever it is, choose whatever relaxation method suits you, but learn biofeedback, self-hypnosis. Learn a method that actually brings your stress and pressure levels down, brings your blood pressure down, actually, as I've proved by taking my own blood pressure when I'm doing it. And uh, there are many studies on this now as well. So find a technique that allows you to calm yourself, to soothe yourself in order to create headroom, as I'm calling it. And there you've got it. That's the technique. Now, the third thing I said I'd tell you is the stress gauge. Well, the stress gauge allows you to scale to be self-aware, measure your stress levels and scale them on a scale of one to ten. You will also be able to pinpoint roughly where the danger zone is. And if you count two or three points back from that, then you'll probably find you are still in a management capability mode 
so you can still manage your stress before you hit the red line. Now it's all explained in the video which is in the notes below and if you're watching this video it's on the screen now. It's one of my videos. It's proved very useful. It's been widely used in my training for many years now. So I, I highly recommend it. That requires practice too. You need to put a little time in to learning to do it intuitively. Now I'm on a six right now. Now I didn't think that right through. I just wondered where I am tension-wise, stress-wise. I guess that's right for an experienced presenter in front of a camera. If I was a nine, you'd probably know it. I'd probably be falling apart, tripping over my words, whatever. So that's a good operating place for me. And I can still think straight and I can still remember to say, please, if you've enjoyed this podcast episode, remember, subscribe to support me, spread the word, leave a comment. Let me know it's been valuable and let others know if you can. Thank you so much for paying attention. This has been Get a Better Handle on Life. I'm Barry Winbolt. You can follow me on YouTube, on LinkedIn or on my website. All the links are below in the description. Thank you so much. Until next time, goodbye.